Howard F. Dosser is a Melbourne-based freelance writer and lecturer who is a regular presenter to the Existentialist Society. The author of Colin Wilson, The Man and His Mind, he has had a long-standing interest in the life and work of Nikos Kazantzakis, whom he regards as being among the most important of 20th century thinkers and writers. In this lecture on Kazantzakis's early dramatic work, Comedy, Dosser explores the freedom Kazantzakis discovered in drawing a crucial distinction between man's religious behavior and his essential spirituality. Here is Howard Dosser. In 1983, the very year in which Nikos Kazantzakis was born, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche began work on a four-part novel which was to take him three years to complete and which was to become famous or infamous under the title Thus Spake Zarathustra. This was the volume in which Nietzsche gave definitive expression to his earlier announcement in his work The Gay Science of the Death of God. As we now well know, it was an announcement that was to reverberate around the world with such momentum that it continues to engage people in fierce debate down to the present time. In fact, Nietzsche's statement was not so much revolutionary as the culminating expression of a shift in religious and theological persuasion that had been taking place for many decades and which was well documented in A. N. Wilson's fascinating publication, God's Funeral. The burden of Wilson's volume is to show how intellectuals in England and elsewhere had increasingly moved away from Christianity across the 19th century so that by its close, the Church of England was largely spiritually bankrupt, even though it retained significant cultural authority and fiscal wealth. Among those identified by Wilson as having participated, whether directly or indirectly, in the re-evaluation of historic spiritual authority within the Church, were such diverse figures as John Stuart Mill, Matthew Arnold, Thomas Carlyle and Alfred Lord Tennyson. The title of Wilson's study was taken, of course, from the 1910 poem of that name by Thomas Hardy, who also played a significant part in separating human spirituality away from its traditional religious form. The essence of Hardy's 17 quatrain poem is disclosed in verses 9, 10 and 12. They read, Till in time's stalest, stealthy swing, uncompromising, rude reality mangled the monarch of our fashioning, who quavered, sank, and now has ceased to be. So, toward our myth's oblivion, darkling and languid-lipped, we creep and grope, sadlier than those who wept in Babylon, whose Zion was a still-abiding hope. And who or what shall fill his place? Whither will wanderers turn distracted eyes for some fixed star to stimulate their pace towards the goal of their enterprise? The philosophico-religious discussion that prompted Hardy's question was itself initiated within a particular climate. Between 1760 and 1840, the Western world had undergone a profound shift in its technology and applied science. 
This period experienced an industrial revolution that effected major changes in the manner in which people thought. A new world was opening before their eyes and their behaviour was being altered by what they saw. Inevitably, these changes led to an assault on prevailing values and men and women began to question their belief structures. In the United States, the Congregational theologian Horace Bushnell stirred up controversy when, in his book God in Christ, he contested the established view of the Trinity of the Godhead. Narrowly escaping censure and a charge of heresy, he retaliated in 1851 by writing Christ in Theology, in which he argued vehemently against the possibility of articulating a dogmatic theology. Seven years later, he produced Nature and the Supernatural, in which he posited a supernatural nature for human beings. While he remained in the ministry until his death, he played a part in bringing into question the assumed authority of theology. American theology took on a more liberal complexion as a consequence of his writings. But others were much more forthright than Bushnell. In Germany, Ludwig Feuerbach refused to draw any hard and fast line between God and man. Known chiefly for his book Das Wesen des Christendoms, translated by the novelist George Eliot as The Essence of Christianity, Feuerbach insisted that God was nothing more than a projection by man of his own nature. Further, the displacement of his highest characteristics into a projected Godhead deprived man of those characteristics so that in embracing the concept of God, man was diminishing himself and surrendering the very traits that were requisite for his ongoing development. Rather than being a divine aid to human growth, religious faith constituted a barrier to becoming. In France, Ernest Renan produced his immensely popular Vie de Jésus, The Life of Jesus, in which he contended that while Jesus was a man of some significance, he was not a constituent part of a Godhead, and indeed was not God. To humanise Jesus, Renan insisted, was to magnify his importance because it was to argue for the improvability of man. Renan was also of the view that the allegedly holy scriptures should be subjected to the same critical scrutiny as any other written document and without subscription to any notion of their divine origin. Finally, in terms of this survey, Denmark's Søren Kierkegaard enunciated a fierce attack on the established religion of his country, proposing that it had lost its way by ignoring the individual, with his capacity for personal choice and freedom to make or refrain from making a commitment to faith. Concerning himself centrally with ethical questions, Kierkegaard challenged the right of the church to impose itself upon men and women as the sole custodian of moral probity. It was 
into the midst of this historic setting that Charles Darwin was to thrust his world-changing epic, The Origin of Species, commonly regarded as the key document in the 19th century reaction against Christianity and certainly having an enormous impact upon not only the intellectuals but also upon the common man whose attitude towards the church and its gospel was being brought under review. Darwin's notion of evolution struck at the very heart of Christianity by implicitly challenging a variety of its dogmas. Opinions divided quickly, with some protesting that it was a ridiculous argument in support of the men from monkeys theory, while others embraced it, concluding that it did not so much dismiss the notion of a creator God as explicate an acceptable methodology of divine creation. Matters came to a head with the famous debate conducted by the British Association for the Advancement of Science when Thomas Huxley declared that the proposition of man's descent from the ape was more desirable than the notion of man as a being who denied or ignored his own capacities. This debate was decisive as a precursor to what has been designated the post-Christian era. The drawing of a distinction between spirituality and religion was a key element in the theological controversy that occupied many minds during that turbulent century. While the spiritual element in man was indisputable, the religious format in which theology and the church had confined it seemed open to question. Religion seemed to be but one of many possible responses a man might make to his own spiritual identity. Certainly, it was becoming daily more obvious that science and art had a much closer relation to spirituality than had been previously recognised, and with this insight, new questions began to arise. If religion was to be set aside, how could man best express his spirituality, and to what purpose should it be directed? In his penultimate chapter of God's Funeral, Wilson quotes William James by way of demonstrating the separation of religion and spirituality. James wrote, I have no living sense of commerce with a God. Nevertheless, he added, there is something in me which makes responses when I hear utterances from that quarter made by others. I recognise the deeper voice. Something tells me hither lies truth, and I am not sure if it is not old theistic prejudices of infancy. Those, in my case, were Christian, but I have grown so out of Christianity that entanglement where therewith on the part of a mystical utterance has to be abstracted from and overcome before I can listen. Call this, if you will, my mystical germ. It is a very common germ. This overview of the intellectual climate that prevailed in the 19th century makes it clear that what was involved was no mere inquisitive discussion within the comfortable domain of agnosticism. This was a battle between theism and atheism. It was a decisive contest that was very largely successful, 
in depriving the notion of God of a supernatural reference and redefining it as an aspect of human identity at its highest. By and large, the 20th century has seen a strengthening of this position, despite the fact that there has been something of a revivalist movement in the guise of fundamentalist Christianity, and that the Islamic faith has displayed its strong influence throughout Asia and the Middle East while making some incursions into the West. This historic background is of crucial importance in any attempt to achieve an in-depth understanding and appreciation of a one-act play entitled Comedy, written by the 26-year-old Nikos Kazantzakis and published in 1909. While on the one hand, this brief dramatic work looked back over the past century and encompassed the essence of its central debate, it also looked forward and anticipated, as we shall see, one of the most important philosophical concepts of the 20th century, the intellectual perspective designated as existentialism. This physically slight one-act work is but a mere 20 pages in length, but what it lacks in length, it compensates for in depth. Written in the main in simple rather than complex or compound sentences, it is engagingly easy to read and yet deceptively profound. It engages its audience with 12 characters, each making a short but symbolically rich contribution to the unfolding dialogue. The play has been produced only rarely, and it was not until May 2014 that it was given its first London production by the Sadler Wells Company, when it was followed by a panel discussion on its content, chaired by Lewis Owen, Foundation President of the London branch of the International Friends of Nikos Kazantzakis. The plot is simple. It opens with two elderly men in conversation, sharing with each other nostalgic recollections of their spent lives, recalling how they sought, but failed, to find a sense of meaning that might attribute value to their existence. As they converse, it becomes apparent that they are waiting, in an uncertain resignation, for a particular male figure to arrive. The play proceeds by way of a series of characters entering the room to join the two men. These characters include a young girl who proves to be awaiting the arrival of her mother, a woman who longs for the arrival of her lover, and a monk who awaits the arrival of his lord. Indeed, all those who emerge on stage are awaiting an arrival, but each expects a different visitor. What becomes apparent, however, is that it is their own perception of God that each person awaits. Each anticipates the divinity who will sustain them in their living by resolving their present respective crises. The needs of these characters, we eventually learn, is centred on the fact of their impending death. But, as the action unravels, we comprehend that all those on stage are simply representations of the wide range of emotions that are bubbling up within the mind of an unseen individual who is himself rapidly approaching death. <laughs> 
The setting for this action is described as being a parlour, furnished with curtains and cushions of soft velvet. A central table bears a candelabrum with seven candles, such as might be seen in a funeral parlour. The single entry to the room is a black door at the end of the stage, which opens and closes silently as the various characters enter. A clock can be heard, ticking time away. The parlour is dimly lit, but in a note that serves as a director's note before this setting is described, Kazantzakis makes it clear that the real setting is not a visible parlour, but the inside of a dying man's head. We are in the mind of a man whose mind is at the end of its tether. This note is of such importance in pointing out Kazantzakis' purpose in writing the play that we should note it in full. This comedy is played inside man's mind at the moment of his death, when the soul rises to the summation and supreme summit of life. Fears and hopes which at night dimly passed and barely touched his mind when he lived and were then forgotten or put to sleep, now suddenly awaken at the moment of death and rise up with an intensity of voice and groans and terror. The voice of faith and disbelief, of grief, of humiliation, of joy and pain, now mingle fraternally and blaze up in the dying man's mind. They crowd frantically on the threshold of consciousness and shout and weep and seek the light. The soul of man, thousand-faced and contradictory and despairing, hangs in this comedy over the brink where men die, stoops over the abyss of the unknown in order to see. Will it now enter into another, an eternal life? Or will it vanish forever? Increasingly, as the play unfolds, it becomes clear that the hoped-for visitor will not arrive, nor does he. It ends with a nun addressing the monk and lamenting, Alas, he's not going to come. By this time, the monk too is resigned. He responds to the nun's despairing realisation with a question, the last line of the drama. Who did you think would come, dear sister? Having spoken, he breaks into sardonic laughter. What is emphatically demonstrated is that there is no one to comfort them, no paradise in which they might be received. Each individual must face the abyss alone. It is difficult to misinterpret Kasanzaki's intent. He is reasserting Nietzsche's announcement of the death of God and the futility of man's foreshadowing the arrival of a divinity that does not exist. Kasanzakis who would go on to study and embrace much of Nietzsche's philosophy several years after composing this play, is declaring his disengagement from religious faith. The emerging spirit of the age had entered into his entrails, and that, together with his sickening experience of the conflict between Christian and myth Muslim mythologies, as he spent his childhood in the shadow of the Turkish occupation of Crete, was sufficient 
to set his spirit free of religious shackles. Why, we might ask, did Kazantzakis name his play Comedy? Two possibilities suggest themselves. On the one hand, he was possibly using sarcasm to belittle the belief system that he had perceived as limiting the choices of men and stunting their intellectual and emotional growth. This seems unlikely, however, since we know from his subsequent writings that he readily acknowledged the valuable role religious faith had played in the mythological pathway men had trodden in their historic ascent. Alternately, we might see comedy as an expression of the irrepressible laughter that arose within Kazantzakis as he himself experienced his first freedom, the freedom from a demanding, absent divinity that expressed nothing greater than man's incapacity to come to terms with his own existential situation. Peter Byrne, in his explanation of the title, quotes an important passage from Kazantzakis. Humanity's life and soul are tragic. Very few of our hopes and desires are realised. We struggle to grasp whatever we can from the muddy and bloody elements that surround us and to turn this into spirit, a wretched, enslaved spirit, a spark in endless night. Here we should note that Kazantzakis is offering the turning of blood and mud into spirit as a human response to the inevitability of death, and this is to become a major theme in his future writings. Comedy was the first in a series of works in which Kazantzakis wrestled with the historic roots, mythological richness and contemporary place of Christianity. His subsequent play Christos and the novels Christ Recrucified, the Greek Passion in its American edition, and The Last Temptation of Christ, extend the beginning he made in comedy to explore the very nature of human spirituality, for he well understood how the latter had been almost inseparably associated with the former since the birth and death of Jesus. Among those who study Kazantzakis today, there are many who contend that his work continues to celebrate the Christian tradition. Such readers acknowledge that he has moved away significantly from the readings and interpretations that prevailed for 2,000 years, but nonetheless see in him a redesign of Christianity to fit in with what they understand to be the needs of modern man. This argument is well represented in an abstract of the paper Kazantzaki's comedy, The Tragedy of Christianity as a Discipline, written by Andrea Rosso Epithemiu, in which she contends that, quote, Kazantzakis refashions Christianity as a social system, end quote. Such an argument ignores the fact that while Christianity as a belief system might be applied to social systems, it cannot be refashioned into a social system without losing its fundamental religious nature. A similar difficulty arises with theologians such as Darren M. Middleton and philosophers such as Daniel Dombrowski, both of whom argue that Kazantzakis transforms 
the unchanging, immutable God into a divinity whose essence is engaged in a process of perpetual change as understood by process theology. It is difficult to see how this reading of Kazantzakis can be sustained in the light of the Kazantzakian novels we have noted. If such readings are to be legitimised, it would seem to be necessary to deny one of the defining characteristics of Christian belief, namely the notion of God as eternally unchanging and, in consequence, to affirm that we have passed into a post-Christian period. That Kazantzakis placed himself outside Christianity, and indeed outside all religious affiliations, is strongly supported by Helen Kazantzakis, when, in her biography of her husband, she refers to herself and to him as being atheists. There can be no doubt within the context of this self-description that she is including her husband, but even if this were not the case, the weight of his entire corpus suggests his position as being beyond religious faith. He did, of course, use the word God repeatedly, but he also took care to define what he meant in using it. Of all definitions of God, he declared, my most favoured is, God is the upright heart at the appropriate time. In a letter written to his wife from Madrid, in 1933, Kazantzakis reflects on his relationship with his father. He states, I was not tied to my father by love, but by a thick, deep root, and even that has been severed now. Indeed, the tree itself has crumbled, and I know that this has had much significance in my life. Now I am much calmer and I sense a feeling of liberation. A burden that has oppressed me all my life has eased and I am beginning to breathe more easily. And I am confident that I will become even more courageous in affirming my independence and more enabled, more competent in facing the tasks I set myself, with no necessity to justify myself to anyone. I feel as if I have attained the freedom of a bird. The shadow that seemed cast over me has dispersed, gone, swallowed by the earth. Clearly, the reference here is to Kazantzaki's biological father, and his capitalization of the word father is to be understood as a mark of respect. But may we not, perhaps, be justified in reading this capitalization as a symbol representing an intellectual escape from the imprisonment of Christian doctrine and the opening up of new worlds. Significantly, in this context, he had spoken earlier of his demanding obligation to remove himself from his mother and father, even to move against them, rejecting their moral standards, their religious faith, their social values and their financial strivings. Whether or not we accede to any special meaning for this capital letter, the fact remains that the passage does reflect the sense of release and freedom that Kazantzakis is seeking to highlight in his drama 
comedy. Unquestionably, the unseen man inside whose mind the play takes place is about to die. But in facing death, he is brought together with the characters we have met on stage face to face with its finality and thus with the necessity to rethink the nature of life itself. With the comfort of heaven denied and the saving grace of God removed, the end purpose of life must be redefined. MVC Jeffries, in his volume Glaucon, which is subtitled An Inquiry into the Aims of Education, introduced the concept of pre-Christian education, which he defined as a conscious attempt to redress those social, cultural and educational factors which have the effect of predisposing a student against the acceptance of a religious interpretation of life. He proposes that it is not until these influences have been negated or refuted that Christian education may be effective. To the extent that Jeffries is correct, may it not also be the case that religious education, in all its forms, limits the capacity of a rational education to occur by virtue of its placing arbitrary limits on the authority of reason and its function in serving its own parochial purpose. In the act of celebrating a religious myth as if it were central to a realistic understanding of life, Christianity and other religious faiths may have a negative effect on the developing intelligence of a child or vulnerable adult. Further, as Paul Newman points out, no order and spiritual authority can exist in a world where minds are led astray by a prodigality of dubious spiritual beings all at war with one another. Kazantzaki's decisive rejection of religion as the key to understanding the nature and value of life constituted a freeing of his mind and the unleashing of a capacity to explore on his own terms rather than on those of an entrenched orthodoxy, those aspects of reality which impinged upon him. Released from predispositional factors, he could interrogate life itself in his attempt to formulate a philosophical position that satisfied his own intellect. He was to accomplish that task with an inordinate degree of success. It has been claimed that in comedy, Kazantzakis expressed an existential view of human affairs and the argument for this claim is strengthened by the publication, 35 years after comedy, of Jean-Paul Cartes' Peace Close, No Exit. In his introduction to the English edition of comedy, Karl Kerenyi points out that existentialist theatre itself existed already in Kazantzaki's play long before the existentialists invented it. In Sartre's play, three individuals, Joseph, Inez and Estelle, find themselves in a locked room somewhere in the depth of hell. All are dead. Tentatively, they begin to approach each other, at first cautious about the degree of guilt they are prepared to acknowledge, but admitting, nonetheless, that 
they have committed grave moral offences that justify their being located where they are. During their conversation, an escape is contemplated, but when the solitary door opens, they do not exit through it. Increasingly, the realisation comes that it is they themselves who constitute hell, for it is in the image each has of the others that each is condemned, found to be wanting, and condemned to punishment. Sartre expressed their eternal pain through his oft-quoted sentence, Hell is other people. Three years after the publication of No Exit, Sartre released a film script under the title Les Jeux Sans Fay. The title is an expression from the roulette croupier to the effect that all bets have been placed. No more bets, ladies and gentlemen. The work has been translated into English under the title The Chips Are Down. It introduces us to Pierre and Eve, both of whom are deceased. The pair stumble across each other as they wait in line to be processed as recently deceased and allocated their appropriate place in the underworld. The assessment clerk, however, discovers that the two were designated as intimates in life, but because they have not met prior to death, they are entitled to a reprieve with a return to life and a meeting there. Returned to the world, Eve and Pierre do eventually come across each other, but both are aware of what has preceded their meeting. They understand that the continuance of their lives depends upon their success in loving each other, but their individual circumstances prove too strong and they cannot make the necessary commitment to each other. The work ends with them in each other's arms, dancing a pas de deux of death, as they realise that their failure to love has condemned them to return to hell. While intending this script to support his contention that hell is other people, and that human beings are defined in part by the perception they have of each other, Sartre, in fact, lends tacit support to the theory of Martin Buber that all actual life is encounter. If hell is other people, then heaven is also likely to be other people. It is in the give and take of relationships that human beings develop and unleash new dimensions of their potentiality. This argument has relevance to Kazantzaki's comedy because it was in freeing himself from the constraints imposed upon him by religious dogma that he began to rethink the meaning of life and eventually became convinced that it was not simply a limited individual experience, but an endless ascent that affected itself by ever-extending relationships. Life thrives in establishing contact with the new that is forever available just beyond the next horizon or in our next relationship. During the concluding months of 1948, Samuel Beckett set down the text of his play, Waiting for Godot, a work that is often spoken of as a successor to comedy. When it was premiered in 1953, it was received with acclaim across the world. Introducing 
the tramp-like figures of Vladimir and Estragon, it presented an apparently absurdist view of an inactive reality in which the search for meaning seems futile. Debate has ensured to the present time as to the identity of Godot, the figure who never arrives. K. M. Baxter, in her fascinating little volume, Speak What We Feel, contends that Godot is undoubtedly God and that he does in fact arrive within the context of the play. His arrival being symbolised in the blossoming between the two acts of a tree that had stood leafless on stage throughout the first act. Beckett himself has said, however, that if he had known who Godot was, he would have said so in the play. But if we lend force to the title of the work, we see that Beckett is positing waiting as an essential component of life and that the waiting is never to be rewarded. Perhaps the essential subject of Beckett's presentation is passivity. Kazantzakis would have seen not only passivity but a mindless futility in Vladimir and Estragon's waiting. Passivity is the antithesis of life, since life requires an active creation, fashioning of an extending reality through human endeavour and a refusal to submit to any enticement to resignation. Kazantzakis, following Bergson, saw life as a force, an energy. If there is no objective Godot approaching us or awaiting our arrival across the horizon, then it might be that life itself is the attainment of higher and yet higher values that we create as we ascend. Here we might note the transformation of blood and mud into spirit, noted earlier as being an appropriate means of dealing with our own mortality. An amplification of the parameters of this transformation was to find extensive expression in the whole of Kazantzaki's life and work. Notwithstanding the interest of theologians in Kazantzaki's literary output, the increasing attention being paid to him might be understood as suggesting a willingness to reflect at some depth on a spirituality that is at a remove from religious sentimentality and theological dominance. The irrepressible nature of the life force asserts itself on every hand, and it retains its capacity for utilising any individual life that opens itself to it. The Kazantzakian challenge to the individual to commit to the enhancement in quality of their own identity is foundational in the enrichment of a society. By attending to the standards by which he himself lives, he points to a higher reality and creates possibilities for its emergence. Man does not need a god to make himself aspire to a fuller, richer life, or to become aware that life is infinitely larger than the individual. Nor does he need any religious doctrine to make him aware that self-gratification, when embraced as a reason d'etre, is an impediment to the perpetual spiritual enrichment the life force seeks to achieve. While the Sartrean notion 
of hell as other people places individuals in a wary and cautious relationship in which competition and suspicion predominate, the Kazantzakian philosophy engenders a sense of mutuality and a cooperative interaction that supports the objectives of the life force. A collective humanity, aware of its own common responsibility, facilitates a living synergy and acknowledges, promotes and celebrates wholeness. As we progress more deeply into the 21st century, the debate about the existence of God continues. In many respects, it is a debate about whether reason or belief shall prevail in determining our interpretation of the meaning of life. The dichotomy is, of course, false. Man has a need for both reason and belief, but there must be no contradiction between them. They are complementary to each other. Our beliefs must be subjected to the highest standards of our intellectual capacity, and our reasoning must not diminish our capacity to respond to those intuitive values that lie at the core of our tendency to fashion beliefs. Myths have an indispensable place in the human saga, but only insofar as we recognise that they are symbols of a reality that lies beyond themselves. We must be careful to resist the temptation recognised by Hardy in his poem to turn our myths into realities, thereby empowering them to restrict our intellectual freedom. It is within this context that the dramatic work comedy is to be evaluated. Its brevity and compactness are deceptive. It is a foundational work in the Kazantzakian canon, not only because of its early publication date, but because it opened the way for the writing of the major works that followed. It is difficult to imagine anyone writing Asketiki, the saviours of God, the central statement in one of the most impressive philosophical theories ever articulated, or indeed any of the later Kazantzaki's novels, without first having arrived at the intellectual platform represented in comedy. Before one can see with clarity, one must remove the shades that filter the light. Outdated myths must be discarded to enable the embrace of newer concepts and higher values. And this is what comedy achieves. The play is critical not simply within the terms of Kazantzaki's own literary development or personal vision of reality. It reflects both a major shift in the intellectual perspective of humanity and a critical reshaping through the genius of a single Cretan man of letters of the human mind itself as it engages in its own dramatic, ever-broadening ascent. <laughs>